Would anyone like a story? It's not really a story like from a book, but it's a story about something that happened in England today. Would you like to know? Mm-hmm. All right. Am I allowed to show my phone? <laughs> it's just a device. <laughs> it's just a little vehicle, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> but it's better if I read it. It's really good. Uh, so this is from my trustee. Minori, who is a um, who is our treasurer, you know her. <laughs> and um, on the twenty second of March, we're supposed to move to the first monastery for bikinis in England. And so, before that happens, <laughs> thank you for your encouragement. Before that happens, we have to transfer basically all the remaining funds, almost, uh, to the lawyer's account. So this is what happened today. <coughs> Tamali, who's another trustee, and I, Nori, did the transfer process after a few struggles today. At lunchtime, when I went to the bank to transfer, I found that it was closed for repairs until the 18th morning. My flight to Australia is at 8am on the 18th. (laughs) Then the customer service advised me to go to a pop-up or temporary bank but I found they only open it on Thursdays. (laughs) (laughs) Then I went to London, Chancery Lane, as that was a full service branch. They said the rules have changed and they need another signatory. (laughs) (laughs) Luckily, Tamali, who is a (coughs) non-trustee and the only signatory, was working in an office 30 minutes away from that branch. (laughs) So to end the story, after an hour of an hour or uh, after an hour of processing, because it's a lot of money, they managed to process the payment. of community health. She says, I'm thankful to have a very understanding line manager. She has to take five hours off today. And a great team who covered about five meetings and an interview. And Tamali's position was such that she could come as well because she only had one meeting. So isn't that amazing? Because that was actually her only day to do it before she's going away. She didn't have another day spare. So I said to her, that's clearly the Dhamma at work, triumphing (laughs) over Mara. (laughs) So that was nice to share. Also how, you know, Mara plays, especially when you're coming close to something really wholesome and good, and and then all these things go wrong, one bank after another. But in the end, (laughs) if you're determined, and if you're sure that what you're doing is the right thing, then the Dhamma wins through, so... I was very happy to hear that, and thank you for your support. It's very kind. <laughs> so, we didn't even spare any time. We're still a minute early. <laughs> okay. Ha! <laughs> I kind of like this que- sort of question, but it might be confronting for some. Mm. It's not that straightforward. Is there... Or is there not a Buddhist equivalent of God, Christ, or Holy Spirit? So, please forgive my um, theosophical uh, ignorance about really what a God, Christ, or Holy Spirit is, because I don't really know in the same detail that the person asking the question might know. But um, I think as a saviour, then no. Um, as the one that created the world, kind of, actually. Like I was talking about this Mara chap the other day, and I was interfering with the bank, actually, as well. (laughs) I mean, it's just a a personification of, you know, forces that are kind of against good, working against good. And it's also a force of control, in a way. And there are lots of different god realms in Buddhist cosmology, like many, Um, They say about 33 different planes, but this can change. It changes all the time, um, depending on our minds, really. So these realms, I guess, are considered to be mind-made, which is one difference, perhaps. 
and that the gods in those realms think that they're creating the world because they last for so long, their lives are so enormous and they have such a life, long lifespan and they see all these other beings being born and then dying and they're still there. So they believe that they're creating all these other beings and they get a little bit proud, of course, <laughs> and think that they're the creator god, you know. So in that sense there are gods, but there are a lot of them. Um, but because of the um, understanding of the Buddha and I guess anyone who breaks through to these truths of impermanence, etc., um, even those realms fall apart. So what tends to happen, and this is talked about in the suttas a bit, is that the devas start to lose their life after eons and eons and eons. It's said like, you know, an hour can go by for a deva and it's a hundred years for a human being. So, you know, if somebody dies in the human realm and then goes up to the deva realm, um, the devas can be, you know, that person can be in the deva realm for like eons and eons. And then if their partner dies, even 20 years later, and turns up in that realm, they say, oh, where were you the last five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> so they don't even notice that somebody's been missing, you know, because the, the, the time is so different. So you can imagine that, like, I, I, if anybody has experienced deep states of meditation, sometimes they feel a bit timeless. Even if it's not a really deep state, but you're just really into it. It can feel like an hour goes by and it feels like 10 minutes. So you're getting a sense of how time is very malleable. Um, but anyway, at the end of their life, especially because they thought they were permanent and invincible and created the world, they actually suffer a lot when they start to realize they're fading away. And actually they have to come back again for another birth. So I think this is the main difference. There are God realms, but they're not considered the the solution or the final uh, resting place, if you like, the uh, temporary heaven realm, perhaps. But uh, we have to keep going round and round and round. And sometimes we fall back to the lower realms, like the animal realms or the hungry ghosts or whatever, really, your mind is uh, primed towards is the kind of rebirth you'll take. So don't worry too much, because if you're human beings, you're practicing the Dhamma, you're likely to get another human birth or even a, a birth in one of those godly realms. But um, in those realms, I think it is possible. Some people say it's not, but it is possible to attain enlightenment. It's just harder because there's not that much suffering and therefore impetus to really practice. And the people there, or the devas, the gods, whatever you want to call them, the spirits, can get um, quite complacent and also quite proud. Like, I have so much beauty and so much strength and... Look at me enjoying all these fruits of my goodness. And they're generally good beings, you know, they've done a lot of generosity or maybe they practice the Dhamma. But um, they can get quite complacent. And I'm sure that that's the case for many of us, isn't it? When things are good, we don't really appreciate it until it's threatened in a way. So I guess that would be a kind of equivalent. And I mean, a lot of Buddhists do actually not exactly pray to the devas, but kind of recollect them as good beings and even aspire to such a rebirth. And it's not altogether a bad thing to do. But if we do have the fortune to actually meditate, we can aspire a little bit further to a fuller end of suffering. Yeah, because you don't really want to get stuck for like eons, right? <laughs> Just enjoying bliss all the time. Does it sound good? Does it? <laughs> My teacher, Ajahn Brahm, has a nice theory. He says, I think it actually comes from some Christian um, theologian or maybe some, some deep thinker anyway, who says that actually there cannot be a permanent heaven. You have to go down to hell for one day a year to appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. So, <clears throat> At times, metta for my eight-year-old flows freely and easily, but I've noticed these feelings of love are tinged with fear, anxiety, and self-interest. What if she's not happy? What if she blames me for it later? <laughs> well, that's obvious. She's going to do that because we are mum. That's that's <laughs> that's the price you pay <laughs> for being a mum. But you'll know it's not true. You'll know that because you understand that things don't go according to people's plans. Not even your daughter's plans. What if she grows up to resent the way I've treated her? Yeah. 
It's really not easy to be a mother. I feel deeply ashamed of these feelings and I fear they're souring my relationship with my child. I've been plagued by these fears since she was born. How can I learn to love her better? Oh, I don't know if they're really souring the relationship. I mean, they might be bringing up anxiety, fear and all the rest for you, but I mean, you're actually, they're stemming from a lot of care, but perhaps a little bit too much attachment in the sense of you're taking her feelings as your responsibility a little bit too much. And I, I can't say that in a kind of judgmental way because I have no idea how it is to be a mother. I can only imagine that you would feel completely responsible for this being that you've brought to the world and that's actually literally a part of your DNA, right? Is that right? Part of your... It's a part of you. She's a part of you in a way. Or at least she, she was. Um... Do you know that beautiful poem by Khalil Gibran? Your children are not your children. Does anybody know it? My mum used to read that, and I was so pleased when I found she was reading it, because she was very attached, in a way that didn't always feel good to me. It felt possessive, and it felt quite stifling, actually, when I was a teenager, because I wanted to be free <laughs> to make my own mistakes. And, and I don't know, probably I did have some blame and resentment to my mum, but I really think if you're a loving mum, which you obviously are, um, kids also have to go through those feelings but they know that you love them and they also work through that so it's not up to you to um, you know to, um, to deal with the feelings that she develops so I would say that the meta at these times can be directed towards those feelings of shame or fear or anxiety and just see if you can be kind to them because it's natural and it's probably a sign that you care and, and just a sign that there's still attachment, of course. But at times the metta is flowing freely and easily so that's beautiful and that shows there's a real kind of foundation of pure love. So I think this is great because it's showing, it's highlighting those places where it's still sticky and I'm sure that'll be a lifelong process, you know, but it's a very powerful um, person to work with, your own daughter. It's not an easy one, I think. So this is why we sometimes take people who are not too close, but this is the real work, isn't it? Purifying a mother's love, beautiful. So I would feel very proud is a funny word, but kind of inspired by yourself for doing this. And here you are learning to love her better by purifying your mind. I hope that's enough. I think it's a process, so I think you're undergoing the process already. I've been finding it difficult to arouse and sustain energy for meta practice. It feels like trying to lift a wet, heavy wool blanket. Oh, maybe you're trying too hard, possibly. Might it flow if I stay with it, even if it feels flat at first? Yes. Or are there better ways to be a friend to this energy? Don't worry about this energy. Don't worry about the heaviness, the wetness. Just let it be wet and heavy for a while. Don't even try and lift it. Otherwise it's heavy, right? Don't even try and lift it. Just be with it and allow it to be there. I mean, metta is supposed to be kind of fun. It's not supposed to be a chore. So it's interesting, sometimes we feel there's all these blockages, but sometimes it's just a slight shift of attention of uh, the way we regard and experience. Sometimes it's such a subtle shift. It can feel like there's nothing there, it can feel very flat. But if we can just kind of tune in to whatever, even flat, because flat isn't necessarily, necessarily painful, even if it's just a neutral feeling, See if you can tune into a subtle kind of ease around that, because there will be one, especially when you're not trying to lift the blanket. So it might be just that your mind's tired and heavy and sad, and you've got all kinds of other emotions that are weighing on you at the moment. The best way is to just wait and be kind and be patient with that. So, and, and you know, from time to time do other practices. You don't have to... Um, you know, keep practicing with the metta. And I think there's a really fine line. It's a general one in practice. One of the hardest um, qualities to navigate is how much energy or effort to use. 
And it's very subtle and it needs to be adjusted all the time. And it's, I guess, quite likely with meta practice that because it is slightly more active than many meditations, we can over-effort, we can use too much force. So maybe just see if the metaphases want to come up from time to time. Just be open to that possibility, but don't actually apply them too much. And don't try, never try to cultivate a feeling. Remember it's giving, which could be just giving your awareness, giving your time. You know, giving this moment to just being present. It's not trying to get something out of it or sustain the energy or get a certain feeling at all. That wouldn't be unconditional. So see if you can make your awareness unconditional. Very exciting, don't they? <laughs> All right. In conversation with a Theravada monastic, they disputed that the Buddha taught metta as something that could be sent to and received by another person. They said it was taught as a wholly internal practice done for enlightenment of the individual meditator. Would you comment, please? <laughs> Um, well I don't really see how your internal practice can't influence the people around you unless you're just living like on a hilltop somewhere miles away from anybody but even then quantum physics has shown you know that like the little slap of a butterfly wing somewhere can cause an earthquake somewhere else and I don't know what else they've found since then Um, so Yeah, I mean, the emphasis should be on purifying our mind. That's really true. But there's no way when metta develops fully and becomes what they call vipulena, it literally means kind of like fulfilled. It's like a a cup that's overflowing. There's no way that that won't be sent or received. And you can feel this. I mean, you can have direct experience of when someone's sending metta to you. My teacher, Ajahn Brahm, he does a little experiment at the end of the metta retreat and gets people to send metta at a certain time during the guided meditation to a loved person. And he used to ask people to then phone the person up and say, what were you doing around such and such a time on such and such a day? And so many times they say, oh, that's amazing you asked. I was thinking of you or I was feeling happy at that time. And he, people did that so many times that he said, okay, stop because he said, phone me up and tell me he said, okay, stop doing that because I'm getting too many phone calls <laughs> so it's just not true that it can't be, I mean, it might be true that if in the formal practice we're not um, uh, that isn't our focus, we're not practicing it to blast someone else you know, or to make someone our friend because then it can get a bit um, clingy in a way, like, or a bit um egotistical even, right? Oh, I'm now sending it to you to make you happy and you're going to know about it. I mean, I'm sure we don't really think those things, but um, it can be a bit of a distraction, perhaps. But um, meta absolutely works. I mean, have you ever walked into a room and you feel an energy in a room? You feel that it's a loving space or you feel it's kind of an edgy space, it's a hostile space. It's because of the energy of the people, whether they have metta, loving kindness in their heart or not. Even animals can feel these things. So I don't know. I think whatever Theravada monastics or any human being, because we're all individuals, right? Whether Whatever name we put on ourselves, whenever we speak, we speak from our experience, and that might be true for them. It might be something they haven't yet experienced, but I don't think that others haven't. In fact, a lot of people I have. So it can, it can. It can definitely be sent. And also... Um, I mean, I'm sure that the Buddha, I can't think of a text now, but he actually encourages us to send and share merits with people, with the departed or with loved ones. I've actually got a verse right here. (laughs) I bought my little book just in case. Uh, Okay, so this is what we should do when others address us with speech that may be timely or untimely, true or untrue gentle or harsh, connected with good or harm. Their speech may be spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. Hereupon you should train yourselves. Our minds will remain unaffected. We shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. We shall abide pervading that person. 
Is that like sending metta? Pervading that person? With a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting with them, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. This is how you should train. So that seems to me a clear example of sending that up, pervading a person, suffusing them, showering them. Go for it. <clears throat> it seems easier to take in a metaphrase if I say it aloud. Is this common? Hmm. Um, sometimes I've done that when I'm on my own in the middle of nowhere kind of thing. Um, simply to bring my mind to the present in a kind of very easy way, like especially if I'm lost in kind of some kind of worry or or something like that, especially in long retreats, if something's not been quite sorted out in your life, it can really get exaggerated. And uh, that happened to me, actually, in one particular retreat. It was a big issue that we had in the trust. Thankfully, we've got wonderful new trustees now, but at that time, we almost lost the project over somebody's really toxic behaviour. So I had a lot of worries, and I actually did practice in this way sometimes. Um, so I can sort of attest to that, that yes, it can be easier because it's a more active practice and sometimes the mind might be more responsive to that. Um, of course, when we're in meditation, we can't really say it aloud. So, And at some point, you'll probably find that you want to be quieter. It's like um, in the sutta that I was going to touch on today about thoughts. The Buddha first talks about having... Uh, wholesome thoughts, so we replace unwholesome thoughts with wholesome ones. So that's something like instead of having, you know, lots of worried thoughts, we have a meta thought like "May I be free from worry," or, or even sometimes in say Mahasi tradition, we just note that thing. Like instead of getting into the detail, we just say, "Oh, worry, worry, worry," um, and this can help to cut through the content and to bring the mind to some more objectivity. But then after we develop wholesome thoughts, he says that uh, even that, even though wholesome thoughts can't harm you in any way, and if you have them for a whole day and night, there'll, there'll be no damage at all. It's like purely good karma that you're creating. But at some point, the body and mind will become tired, and because of that, they won't be able to enter deep samadhi. They won't become still. They won't become tranquil. So there's a kind of process there of active, wholesome thinking, which could start with actual speech, right? And then a little bit more subtle, maybe our inner voice, maybe eventually just a mood <clears throat> or a tone or an emotion. And eventually um, the residue of that will actually settle and still the mind. So it's a, a gradual thing. Yeah. But don't do that in the hall, because if everyone does that, then there'll be all kinds of <laughs> weird conversations going on. <laughs> be interesting, wouldn't it? See what people say to themselves. <laughs> A few years ago, after a retreat, I was meditating and pondering self or non-self. I asked myself the question, well, what if I just dropped the self? What would that be like? Suddenly, there was only chitta just knowing. <laughs> and in that moment, all the conditions supported self, supporting self, uh, were absent. It was impossible for the self to arise. In fact, it felt like the concept of self was indefinable. So is that a stream entry experience? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's, it's a moment of insight into non-self. But if you were to look deeper into this, there would still be a sense of it is the chitta that is the self. That's why I say no. And unfortunately, this view that the chitta is who we really are has somehow got infiltrated into Theravada Buddhism. I don't know from where. Well, I kind of know from where. Some branches of the Thai forest tradition. And, of course, there are different kind of Buddhist schools as well. But in early Buddhism, it's very clear that this chitta is not a thing. It's a process. 
and it's exactly synonymous with vinyana and with mano, which means consciousness or another word for mind, mano, kind of the knowing part of the mind. But it's all just knowing, and it's a process, it's conditioned. So um, it's a really nice insight. We would have to see how that would develop in your daily life. Um, usually the insight into non-self also comes with the understanding and the experience of everything ceasing, even the knowing mind. So whilst you're getting a glimpse, and it's great, it might be that we just have to keep going. And even for people who do attain what is eventually becomes obvious that it was a stream-winning experience, even though they're pretty sure of that, in fact, sure of that at the time, they still wait for a year, two years, for the dust to settle, so to speak, to really see if they're actually changed, and they really are regarding um, life, themselves, others, from a completely different paradigm. So it's a very, very deep experience, something that I think is, again, getting quite diluted. Um, I guess everywhere that Buddhist practice is becoming more mainstream. Um, but rather than sort of ask ourselves what stage we're at, I always think it's better to just say, let me go deeper, let me keep digging. You know, because as long as we're still suffering, you've got more work to do. So try not to worry too much about these experiences, whether it was a jhana, whether it was stream winning. The thing is, when they really are, you'll know. You'll really know. Um, it'll be something like a complete breakthrough that shocks you. That's not just like, oh, that was kind of a nice experience where there was less of a concept of self. Um, I mean, it can also feel like there's no self present in the deep states of jhana, and this is probably not that deep. But that's still not stream winning. That's still just having a far more refined sense of self. There's still the idea that the mind is the self. And it's subtle, but to actually penetrate, to see the mind as a process, takes an incredible amount of samadhi or insight, but I think a combination of the two. But I won't speak too much more about that because it's better when somebody who's really sure of these things can speak. But this is my understanding from my teachers, from my experience to a degree, and from the suttas as well. So, yeah. In response to something that was said earlier, probably that I said, <laughs> could you elaborate on why it would be arrogant or wrong to tell one's friends or family members that one is sending them loving kindness while on a loving kindness meditation retreat? Yeah, arrogance a bit strong. It's probably not arrogant as such. Whether it's right or wrong, you might have to figure that out for yourself. I think I answered that more in relation to somebody who had asked the question from the perspective of their friends or family feeling that the others might get put off by it. So I was trying to say in that case, in that context, it might not be skillful perhaps, but I might have used those words wrong or arrogant and um, they're a little bit strong in this case. It's not really wrong. It's just maybe you have to have very receptive friends and family members. I mean, I do tell my certain friends and family members that if I feel it will make them happy or they feel cared for that way. But um, I don't know. I've found that it's better to just embody what we practice than tell people about it, generally speaking. Otherwise it can sound a bit like, I've got all this meta that you need. I mean, it can be interpreted that way, right? So it's just a sensitive thing. And I might be wrong. You might be fine to tell these people. What if these people were taking care of the yogi's pet or work while they're away? And, oh, and they meant it as a gift of gratitude, along with chocolate and flowers. Thank you for explaining. Go for it. If you feel that would be lovely for them to know, then why not? You can tell them we were all sending the meta because once we read this, that sounds so sweet. So. <laughs> That's okay. Would you please post the name of the book you referenced this morning that you're studying in your Zoom class on the Yogi Notice Board? Yes. Also, any other books you recommend to strengthen and maintain this practice? Yes. For now, it's Social and Communal Harmony by the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, and I shall 
write it up on the board. And not everyone might like my other book recommendations, but I'll just give what I think is a nice book. Etiquette or customs questions. Bowing. Seems like some folks are bowing when they enter, others when seated, some at the start, some at the end, (laughs) some to you, some to the Buddha. (laughs) When should we bow? (laughs) I'm not bowing at all yet. (laughs) So there's a huge diversity of bowing styles. That's wonderful. That's what we want, diversity. (laughs) I'm glad that you haven't mentioned that I bow really strange now because I have this um, hernia here, so it means that the... Mm, Tommy comes above the esophagus and doesn't this thing doesn't shut this uh what do you call it thingy valve I forget esophageal esophageal valve yeah we call it esophageal esophageal valve something anyway so if I do then uh, you don't know what might come up so uh, that's why there's all kinds of bows <laughs> and uh, I think that's quite good actually I think that's quite nice I mean. For me, bowing has to mean something. And, and yeah, you can be told, okay, everybody bow three times, but then it can start to feel a bit disingenuous or a bit like, oh, it's just repetitive or it's just a kind of um, ritual. Um, in some monasteries, you kind of don't have a choice, so everyone bows at a certain time. And in that case, it can be nice to reflect on what those bows mean to you. So my teacher, Ajahn Brown, he always says that he's bowing to virtue the first time, peace, and then compassion. But it could also be virtue, peace and wisdom, same, same, or whatever, whatever qualities you want to develop in your heart or that you feel the Buddha represents to you. But if it's just a ritual, then it doesn't necessarily um, do very much. Sometimes for me, um, in my busy life in the monastery, I know it shouldn't be a busy life in the monastery, um, I come down and I've just been on meetings all morning and then... I'm a bit late for lunch and I come into the room and bowing is a really nice way of reminding myself to transition from the busyness and to centre myself in the moment and to have this sense of respect for the people that are offering me food, for my holy life, for the Buddha to give me the opportunity. So it's a really nice way to just get back in touch with the meaning of what I'm doing and that's kind of what it means to me. So it doesn't really matter. I mean, traditionally... If you're in a Buddhist temple, you would bow when you come in, and then you might bow to the Sangha member, but not to me, but to the Sangha. I'm representing the Sangha, as in the monastic Sangha. Um, So really what your heart feels to do, nobody's even... I haven't noticed, actually, but you have, but I haven't. (laughs) So um, please feel free to either try, see how it feels, or just carry on, not bowing yet. (laughs) The first time I bowed was actually, um, I think it was one of the first times, or if not the first, was when my teacher, Goenkaji, my first teacher, and I was living in India at that time, I'd spent nearly a year in the main uh, Vipassana centre, Dhammagiri, <coughs> studying some Pali and serving a lot of retreats. And at the end of a, I think a 45 day, or a, maybe it was the month long teacher's retreat that I'd been sitting on, I wasn't a teacher, but I I qualified anyway, because I sat so much. Um, he came just walking around this huge pagoda that he'd built with, must be about 500 individual meditation cells. Really powerful. And he just came walking and chanting metta, and it was so powerful. And all these Indian ladies had put down their dupattas, these scarves that they wear on their uh, kutta. And they put them on the floor for him to walk on. And he was walking along, and I had my hands folded, and I was just so moved, I just had to go down. I just felt like it was wrong to be at the eye level, because I was just so moved, and so... I just felt blessed, you know. It was through the practice, but it was also the gratitude that came from that. And, uh, yeah, just that our teacher would now be showering us with so much metta, and the whole kind of display of genuine uh, devotion. Yeah to one who had shown us the path. He was my first teacher. Stillness. This is two questions. Oh, that's two questions. You've apologised. It's two questions. <laughs> that's really sweet. No, you can put two questions. Stillness. Should I try not to move during sitting meditation? If I feel pain or discomfort, should I observe the pain or discomfort? Or should I adjust my posture? 
Generally speaking, when you're doing samadhi practice, I would say try to be as comfortable as you can. And you can observe the pain a little bit, but if it becomes like your main object, then you're kind of moving away from the samadhi and into more of an insight practice, which is well, it's okay. But if you're trying to develop stillness, then usually what helps you to sit longer is when the stillness deepens and the happiness starts to arise, then this kind of incense um, brings about a lot of bodily comfort because the mind gets more comfortable and it sort of reflects on the body. So I would say uh, move if you need to move. Try and, first of all, be very careful about how you position your body in the beginning, which is why I say even attend to little things that don't seem like a big problem but could become niggly after a while. Um, And then if you have to move, just be aware that you're doing that and you're making that choice through compassion rather than through reactivity. And... um, See if it eases. It may or it may not. If it doesn't, then you can observe it and be kind towards the pain. You're very welcome to put two questions. I was just joking. And then I saw that you'd actually said sorry as well. (laughs) (laughs) I was having the same experience as the person who wrote yesterday about the different flavours of metaphrases. Now I feel stressed about not looking too closely when I repeat the phrases. Oh dear, I have to be very careful what I say for fear of inviting in too much diversity. Oh, don't worry about it then. You know that Ajahn Chah has this um, quote because people used to uh, say, you know, you said this and then you said this and you're contradicting yourself. Why do you say this and then this and then? And he said, well, if people are, you know, riding a bicycle and they're going a bit too far to the left, I tell them to go to the right. And if they're riding their bicycle and it's veering right, then I tell them to go to the left. So this is why. So if you're getting um, stress coming up because of that, then choose diversity instead of stress. (laughs) It's okay if you notice the different flavors. I said yesterday that you're getting mindful, and it's not a bad thing when mindfulness is arising, but the whole thing is a process. So that's good in the beginning, but over time you'll probably find, naturally, that those flavors will kind of merge and there'll be more of a unified, generalized sense of meta-feeling. So it's just not to get kind of caught up in it and like start analyzing it and like, oh, let me see, now I say this phrase, oh, you know, oh, let me try this. It's just not to get too caught up, but if you're just noticing that naturally, it's really okay, no problem. It's actually very nice. I tried switching to only one, but it isn't as interesting for the mind. So go back to what you were doing before, and please don't stress. Everything's going just fine. Mm -hmm. Yes. What are the common pitfalls or mistakes that first-time meditators or students make, meditation students make? Same question, but for advanced yogis, gosh. I have no idea. I guess impatience. <laughs> it's not that we make mistakes, it's just that we're learning on the job. You know. I mean, mistakes, what's a mistake? It's just something that you haven't, you know, you're trying to do, you haven't yet figured out quite how to do it, and you're learning, right? Mistakes are a good thing. Because when you learn what doesn't work, you can learn what does. And I guess the thing we could do more with, I suppose that's what, how I would interpret the question, or maybe rephrase it, what are the qualities we could maybe use more of, and that would be things like patience. I guess not taking the meditation personally, which is really difficult in the beginning, because we've taken our whole life personally. And um, just learning that meditation is about putting the causes in place, and trusting That if you carry on putting those causes in place, the kindness, the awareness, the patience, the trust, the confidence, some investigation, etc., then your mind will learn. Your mind is really wise and really intelligent. You know, you've learned so many things in your life. You learn to stand, you learn to put your own socks on, you learn to, you know, do so many really complicated things. So we can learn to meditate too. So mistakes... I don't know, but there can also be unskillful ways we approach the meditation, I guess. And again, it can be part of the process. For example, spiritual bypass comes to mind. Everybody can be doing this. 
including so-called advanced yogis, because who's really advanced? I don't know. How can we measure? We're all just learning. You know, until you actually are a stream winner, you're not even called a trainee. You're training to be a trainee. <laughs> Only after stream winning you become a trainee, one who's in the real training, because you actually have right view then. And right view is the precursor to every other factor becoming right, in the sense that it leads to liberation. Until you're there, you're just trying, you know, it's trial and error. But one of the things we can do sometimes is come to meditation to improve ourselves, or come to meditation because we actually don't like ourselves, and some of that might be inevitable, that's okay. Again, it's not a mistake. It's just that the spiritual path is not meant to make us a better person. Or There's nothing wrong with us already. It's to understand how we behave, how the mind behaves, and how we cause suffering for ourselves. It's to understand that, and it's to learn to be courageous enough to gently, gently start to turn towards the suffering. Yeah? Metta's not like a plaster across the suffering. It's helping us to be resourced enough to turn towards. And I know from some of the group discussions that that's happening for people. You know, they're practicing the metta and then some obstacles to the metta come up. Not mistakes. And that enables them to dig a bit deeper into the way their mind works, the way they kind of block themselves from happiness, you know, by putting this layer over it, like of guilt or of aversion or whatever. Um, so it's all worthwhile and I think if we approach meditation from the perspective of wanting to learn what's going on in our mind we can never really make mistakes does that make sense? yeah for advanced meditators the mistake is probably thinking that they're advanced (laughs) (laughs) And actually, getting more impatient, and I've seen this in myself and probably in lots of others, um, that the more you've been practicing, the more you think, oh, you know, I've been practicing a long time now. Come on, you know. And actually, the longer you've been going, the more patience you need. You need to have much more patience because the changes get subtler. Like you've overcome a lot of the grosser things and the results aren't as obvious as they are after your first retreat. And uh, you might go through much bigger challenges too, especially if you put in a role like mine. So you see all these kind of emotions coming up that you haven't had in years, you know. You were like completely balanced because you had such an easy life, like lots of the monks always have. (laughs) And then suddenly you're really in the kind of fire pit. And if you're not wise, you might think you're regressing, but actually it's just that you're rising to even more difficult challenges. So measuring ourselves is a mistake. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so many questions, so little time, smiley face. <laughs> Both yesterday and today. I thought you were saying bath yesterday and today. <laughs> really? You've got bath? <laughs> between practice times while walking between the buildings, I have had insights arise and was happy and surprised about this. I've experienced this after insight meditation practice. Is this expected with meta practice? Definitely. More so, probably. Please, just one more. Okay, I better answer that question first. The reason I say more so is because in the beginning of my practice, as in the first 14 years, um, (laughs) I thought that insight practice was, I mean, we didn't really call it insight practice, but it was called vipassana, so it kind of implies that you're going to get loads and loads of insight, right? Or that the practice itself is a way of of insight. But later I realised that actually insight is something that arises from practice. It's not a method. You can't actually do insight. Insight is something that arises. And the Buddha always says again and again in the suttas that insight arises from samadhi. Samadhi pachya yata bhutanyana dasana, which means from samadhi, from the deep meditation, still states of mind, um, we're able to see things as they truly are. Yata bhuta means as they are, not as we think they should be or we'd like them to be. And one of the reasons is because as long as the five hindrances are still operating, we're not actually seeing things as they are. So with metta, we're undermining 
ill will and a lot of other hindrances too because you'll find that when the happiness starts to arise you become much more contented within and you have less need for sensuality, for lust and for craving because there's so much more contentment arising. So it's helping to overcome all of the hindrances bit by bit and, and then you have much clearer, uh, a much clearer mind to be able to actually see things as they are. So yes, it's expected after metta, or with metta practice. And it always goes hand in hand, you know, even with insight practices, there is samadhi there. There is a degree of sustained awareness, of absorption into the subject. I mean, I used to, I guess, less and less so actually move through the body, but still feel a lot happening all the time. And, but it was samadhi, it was sustained because I had one particular perception which was the changing nature of my experience. So there was a lot of samadhi, a lot of calm there and also an undermining of the hindrances. But um, with this kind of practice we ideally would be going towards even deeper states of samadhi where for some time we actually can enter the realm of the mind without the five senses, not just without the five hindrances, but without the five senses. And this is why it's the Brahma Loka. It's another Loka, actually. These states of jhana are called Uttari Manusa Dhamma, which means like superior human states. They're not what you experience in everyday life. And of course, there's lots of discussion about what constitutes a jhana and what doesn't. But um, the main purpose is that we're starting to uh, really clear our mind and actually have some insight into the mind itself as well. So, um, yeah, so that's very uh, expected. Not that you would want to expect it. They always come up unexpectedly. But um, it's, a, it's, it's a natural thing to happen. Please, just one more. <laughs> For a lay person, is there a daily practice time length or goal in order to gain the most benefit. Yes, every day. Many, many thanks. Um, we'll talk more about that towards the end. It doesn't really matter like how long you're sitting, but see that you do it regularly as much as you can. And I'm, I, I'm aware that I just said the word sitting. Practice can be outside the sitting as well. In fact, practice needs to be the whole of our life eventually. So, But some formal sitting practice daily is really great. And if you don't manage it every day, at least Try to manage it as regularly as you can. And set goals that are not too high, that you get discouraged when you can't meet them. Yeah. We'll go more into that later. Because you're still on retreat. You're in the heart of it now. What did the Buddhists say? Oh, this is good. This is a, a joke. <laughs> what did the Buddhists say to the hot dog vendor? Oh, <laughs> make me one with everything. <laughs> Oh, is that a Buddhist or a Hindu? Sorry, I'm being cheeky. <laughs> mm. If some people are conditioned to believe that they don't have the will to change, can all suffering really ever end? If some people are conditioned to believe that they don't have the will to change, can all suffering really ever end? I mean, we're all conditioned in the wrong way. None of us have right view in the beginning. So as long as they practice, then yes, the views will slowly get changed because the practice will start to bring benefit. And another benefit of practices like metta and any practice that emphasizes happiness is that eventually you get a little bit um, sucked in. So the process starts to happen despite you, even if you don't want it to. <laughs> So it's like you get kind of hooked on meditation and sooner or later you will see more deeply and you will see that suffering starts to subside. So yeah, suffering will, but of course um, the extent to which it will cease depends on the wisdom we develop. So eventually we do have to um, overcome our wrong view our wrong conditioned beliefs. But don't worry, because everyone has wrong view until they have right view. So whatever view that is um, can be undermined. I guess the, the main obstacle is if somebody doesn't actually want to meditate or you know hear the Buddha's teachings. But I don't know. 
Maybe I've been conditioned by my teacher a lot by now. I think eventually they have to. Once we suffer enough, you know, usually you have to just suffer a lot and then have the good fortune to come in contact with the teachings. But at some point, you just can't resist it anymore. Yeah. So if you're here, don't worry, you're all fine. And you'll be influencing the people around you because they'll see that you're starting to suffer less. Or even just be more honest about this the fact that you're suffering a lot. It's good as well, isn't it? Energy from the practice is growing strong. What are the most skillful ways to hold it in the body and not leak it all over the place? (laughs) (laughs) And direct it towards deepening practice. Yeah, just what you said, really. Hold it in the body and don't leak it. (laughs) I don't know. I'm just a bit tired today, so maybe I'm not very bright. Um, um, what are the most skillful ways the thing is we always want to find ways to improve but it sounds to me like everything's going fine you're aware that it might leak you're aware that it's good to try and sort of hold it in the body I mean by holding it it doesn't mean you're like holding it holding it it just means that you keep your awareness somehow connected to your body you stay embodied as much as you can throughout the day Um, and you don't start looking around and kind of inviting too much sense stimulation because if you've got a lot of energy, it can really have an impact. It's like your mind will just go into like even small print on things because it's like, and uh, you know, you feel like you're not going to get tired, but eventually you kind of will. So um, maybe being really gentle with it actually could be a skillful way. Um... Keeping the mind soft, because energy can be a little bit full-on sometimes. And if we kind of go with it, we might also become a bit kind of full-on, supercharged. So maybe seeing if that energy can be there, but your way of being aware of it is very soft. That might be one way. But uh, again, it's an experiment, you know. If you find it's leaking, then you might have to work out your own ways to... uh, to keep it contained. A little bit of leaking should be okay. I'm just aware that, you know, with these kind of me giving the answer, it can seem like the definitive kind of do it this way, don't do it that way. Please don't take it that way. I'm just exploring it with you, really, um, having a discussion because I'm also just learning these things. So. Are there books on early Buddhism you recommend? Yes, the suttas. <laughs> Maybe put on the notice board, yes. But I won't pin the suttas to the notice board. But, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, there are some easier books that help you start accessing the suttas, which are this one, for example, The Social and Communal Harmony, and also In the Buddha's Words by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Um, but even more than books, I actually think to get into the early Buddhism, it's great to have good teachers who can explain or unpick or unfold the suttas through their practice, through their years of, you know, working with these texts and um, practicing and having them explained by their teachers as well. So, um, yeah, I don't really want to self-promote. I do some sutta classes, but even better than that, my teachers do as well. So um, go to the source if you can. Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali, they have some great sutta classes online on the BSWA channel. Really wandervol. Um, I think Aya Santuska and Aya Chittananda also do some sutta-based teachings there in California, right? And I also have a lot of that stuff as well. At the moment, mostly this book, because I think it's approachable and we're building a community, so social and communal harmony is very um, relevant. And it's also the foundation of practice, and it includes chapters on all kinds of aspects of the teachings, such like easy bite-sized kind of bits, except it's taken us two years to get through. <laughs> so uh, I'll think about other books and uh, write them up for you. Maybe I should only do that on the last day, though. What do you think? Is, is, would anyone mind? Is anyone desperate? <laughs> we'll see. All right. I have too big of an ego around being smart. 
<laughs> yeah, I sometimes have that as well. I'm not even that smart anymore. I used to be. <laughs> but I still think I am, so it's like really annoying. <laughs> Explaining things I don't understand. Uh, and or feeling like I already know the answer when questions are answered by people who actually understand. <laughs> It's great that you're so honest and aware. Oh, that's really funny. How can I stop being such a smarty muck smart face? <laughs> There's a nun like that in uh, Perth. We call her the smart Alec. I think she calls herself the smart Alec. So she, she's kind of like that. She knows she's a smarty pants. And we just love her for that, you know. Because if you've got that sense of humour around it, it's kind of cute. It's not such a big problem. Um, I don't know. I mean, if it really makes you suffer, then just see it as a bit of suffering and maybe notice how it could sometimes potentially block your ability to listen, maybe. You know? Sometimes you might interject too soon and somebody else might have been saying something that was more than just the words. It might have been, you know, said through their being or said through their energy, for example. I mean, I can do that sometimes with Ajahn Brown because I've heard all the jokes, I've heard all the teachings, I know what he's going to say. I really know what he's going to say. Like, I can practically (laughs) say it with him. But it's like, is that really being smart or is that just kind of missing where it's coming from? You know, so sometimes our intellect runs away with us and we miss out on actually listening. So, but it's great that you're aware of this. I mean, I'm sure most of us, I don't know, is anyone else like this? (laughs) <laughs> yeah? Lots of people. Okay, to some degree. Yeah, great. Okay, so you're not alone. Isn't that nice? The problem is if two of you get together. <laughs> <laughs> then we've got two smarty smart faces together. Or more. Yeah. But, you know, I guess our kind of analytical side, if we've been um, educated in... Uh, these kind of societies. I don't like saying the West anymore because apparently that's a bit racist, is it? I don't know. I always used to say it because I was always in Asia, so it was like Asians and Westerners. Anyway, in these kind of societies, Western societies, or any countries where they have the sort of Western education systems, I think we're taught to really um, measure ourselves by our intellect. I mean, everything's analysing us that way. The way that we're, you know, um, examined is all around how much you know, isn't it? It's not how you feel or how you treat people. So um, it's just a residue of that. So it's good to be on a loving kindness retreat because you have to feel. When I am meditating on myself or a loved one especially, I find that my thoughts become more like a prayer or a pleading for their happiness and safety or that they're loved. I just love that you're so aware of this. You know, there's so many nuances, aren't there, in these um, questions. You know, it's just simple phrases, but we can see all our tendencies just through having that as a sort of... um, It's really just a a meditation subject that shows us the tendencies of, of our mind. And that is the real practice. It's not the phrase. It's not even saying it correctly. It's the fact that it's showing you the way your mind works. So this is very good that you're realising this. This starts to feel either like grasping or begging kind of feeling, or I sense that I'm trying to manifest goodwill into their life. Yeah, so stay with the energy in yourself at this point. You know, Stay with the energy in your heart. You might find that you are um, able to uh, sense into what it's like to grasp or beg, and you'll notice that kind of clinging, that craving as an embodied experience, which is also very insightful. Because you'll realise it's not actually that pleasant. In fact, it it kind of pollutes the metta. And it is known, you know, attachment. It's a kind of attachment, right? Attachment to to the outcome or attachment to how another person feels. Um, It is the sort of near enemy of loving kindness. Um, Or is it the far enemy? No, the far enemy is hate, right? These are sort of made up by the commentaries. But the the far enemy is like the opposite. So either ill will or fear or something like that. And the near enemies are things that are kind of um, often come along with it, but actually are sort of impurities of loving kindness. They're very close to it, but they're not the real thing. So this is how they get purified, just by seeing them, by having awareness of them, 
um, connecting maybe with the energy of them and letting it be. And gradually the mind will let go of that because it will feel like it's spoiling the metta somehow. You will incline more and more to the beautiful part of that wish. What is the correct view I should have towards this feeling of loving kindness so that it doesn't turn to a plea or become desperate? Yeah, I mean, maybe a bit more equanimity might help, you know, sort of reflecting even at the beginning of a sit that people are subject to their karma, you know, not to my wishes for them. They will fare according to their own behavior, their own um, karma, if you like. Not destiny, right? But depending on the seeds they plant, <clears throat> that's what they'll reap. And you can care, but you can't actually cure anybody. You can't actually um, make them well or happy. And just try to connect with the intention, the purity of the intention. First of all, establish it in a pure way, but then actually start to notice there's a beauty to that. There's a beauty to just wishing someone happiness in a more objective, detached and equanimous way. So maybe a bit of equanimity would be helpful there. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I do wonder if the word may is a bit problematic. But one of my teachers, Bhante Sajato, he's not really my teacher, but I like his talks on loving kindness and his um, sort of instructions. A bit different from how I do it, but similar. Um, he says that sometimes people come to him after the first day and they say, you know, I have a problem with the word happy. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next person comes and they say, I have a problem with the word may. <laughs> and then he's like, well... What about the word B? Is that okay? <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> they are words, but maybe they can sometimes bring up a sort of some other thing that they're associated with. So I don't know, maybe you could change the word may and just say I wish you or something like that. Hmm. Or you could even just say the word itself. But I don't want to kind of give too many ideas because then it sounds like there's something wrong here and actually it's great that you're noticing this. So um, just be aware of when it changes and maybe be aware of the feeling and try and catch that moment that it's changing. We'll see how it is when it's not there and, you know, congratulate yourself for that because, again, we've got that biased mind that only sees when things go a bit, you know, not perfect, but we don't see when they're actually going perfectly well. So most of these questions are about difficulties or perceived difficulties, which I actually don't think are, but uh, you won't have that many questions about all the lovely, flowing, loving kindness that came mm -hmm. out, <laughs> which is definitely happening because I'm feeling it in the room. Yeah. So, wonderful. We're on time today, so um, we could have a couple of minutes of quiet sitting together to just end the day. And once again, thank you very much for your sincere practice and very helpful questions, which I'm sure everyone benefits from. That's another reason I like to uh, do these sessions, because we all probably relate to many of these things. And if you wish, maybe just taking the last moments to spread loving kindness or just sit quietly, whatever you desire.
And just to end with a little observation or reflection to hopefully give you encouragement is that to encourage you to be confident that you know what loving kindness is. Through these questions, it's clear that you're able to identify those subtle hindrances like guilt or worry, pleading, wishing, wanting to affect another. Very subtle hindrances to the purity of loving kindness that you know. And you're able to see. So you do have an intuition for what real love is all about. So just to have confidence in our ability to know loving kindness, that it's already there, and to notice when it is present. Even as an absence of ill will. Progressing on this path, beautiful path of Dhamma. Keep developing our virtue, our stillness, our loving kindness, and our wisdom. May we all be liberated. May we all be free. And now you're liberated and free to go to bed.